we started the day talking about some of the catalysts around esports, and um, one of the one of the big ones is mobile esports, and it's certainly something that uh, we've seen take off in a big, big way in Asia, and still uh, is early in making its way here. And we're very lucky today to have Jeff Chow with us to speak about this. Jeff is. Uh, probably the most outspoken guy on the potential of, of mobile esports, and he's bringing um, a lot of expertise from on the ground experience from Asia. He's uh, the CEO of a mobile social esports app called Game Gather. He may say something about that. Uh, I'll leave that to him. But he's also um, been involved with several of the top uh, esports teams on their mobile esports initiatives, including the Immortals, TSM, Team Liquid, um, and he's also been a caster, so he's uh, worked with Tencent on their mobile esports productions. You've been a coach, I think, and a pro player. So this guys he's done it all in esports. So please welcome Jeff. Ciao. Thank you, Scott. I think I have the mic. All right, this is a topic I'm very, very excited about. But before I kind of kick off, I want to talk about where we are. Esports, as you know, PC started because online multiplayer was basically um, the catalyst was broadband internet, PC bongs, which gave birth to PC esports. So what we're seeing now is a phone is a PC in your pocket, and online multiplayer, core multiplayer gaming has now reached the smart forum. And before I kind of introduce my background, I just want to show you this video of uh, the mobile esports event in China here in Wuhan in 2019. So, like Scott said, I was a pro player, um, and I competed all over the world in the US. These people that play on their smartphones, they are literally rock stars. I mean, who'd have thought, if you guys listen, like, you're watching someone play a mobile game on a smartphone, and they're getting paid six figures plus. That is the life right there in China. And this is a 1,500-seat stadium in Wuhan. The KPL sells out the stadium from 15,000 to 18,000 seats consistently. Tickets go from $20 at the upper seats to $50 at the closer seats, and the VIP tickets can go up to $2,000 because it's a, it's a kind of a bidding system. Yeah, so it's amazing to see the growth of mobile esports. It's not something that's known in the West, um, but it has, it's growing everywhere outside of the West. Brazil, Southeast Asia, China, and I'll talk about the numbers and what's really driving this phenomenon that has happened literally within the past few years. A little bit about my background. I co-founded a mobile esports org, Hammers Esports. I was a professional player. I was a mobile streamer. I also worked on mobile initiatives with Team Liquid where I helped field it and lead a team to compete at Tencent's Arena of Valor Asia International Competition in South Korea. I also was a, com a competitor playing for Immortals. I also became their GM and head of mobile. And currently, I'm working with TSM, which is, which is not announced, but I'm working with them on helping them enter esports in India and Brazil, which Team Liquid has uh, just entered recently and announced their Free Fire squad. Um, I also talk a lot about mobile and why it's happening, because a lot of people don't understand why this is an esport. It, basically, the traditional sports people that complain about PC esports and saying that's not a real sport have now become the new boomers where they are talking about mobile esports is not real esports or not real gaming. Um, and it's very interesting to see that kind of trend happen here as a new generation, a new phenomenon kind of takes hold in the esports industry. So let's start with this chart. You can see mobile in 2011 grew bigger than PC and console, $25 billion in 2011, estimated to grow now up to 80 billion dollars, and now a lot of what's driving the growth is not the Candy Crushes that you see. Candy Crush always gets brought up when I talk about mobile. It hit 550 million monthly active players in June of 2014. Today, Candy Crush is sitting around 250 million monthly active users. What's driving a lot of the growth in mobile gaming is core games, 
140 games make over $100 million, and the ones that make a billion dollars are all the mobile esports titles, like Honor of Kings that I just showed you, PUBG Mobile, Free Fire, which I'll go into more detail. And the interesting thing is, even though 82% of all mobile game downloads are casual games, we get it, it's big, 56% of the time spent on mobile gaming are these core games, multiplayer games, right? And 76% of the spending are core games. And these action multiplayer games have been taking up a large piece of the pie. So now App Annie has released their kind of state of mobile for 2020, and they have a much more aggressive prediction. They're saying that mobile is going to be a $100 billion industry this year. That's kind of insane. That means it's more than PC and console combined. And already, as of 2019, it's 25% bigger than all other gaming put together. So mobile is a massive, massive trend. And the main point that I want to talk about today is it just takes one game. One game is what will change and introduce esports to a platform like StarCraft, Counter-Strike GO, League of Legends did for PC. There are some amazing games on mobile that now have become esports and made some people pretty, pretty wealthy. And you can see Garena's valuation has increased because of that one game. You can see the amount of revenue that has increased, amount of money they made. Almost 10% of those users now are paying users, which is very, very high for any mobile gaming company. Um, and they're also one of the top performing stocks. You compare them to Apple, all the other tech companies, all the other game companies. Garena was the top performing tech gaming stock of last year, growing at 255%. And there's humble beginnings. Every esports starts as a very humble beginning. I just talked to someone that is from PUBG, but PUBG is extremely popular. PUBG PC specifically is extremely popular in Vietnam. People think mobile esports is because they don't have access to PC. Um, that's, that's some of the reasons, but a lot of these countries have thousands of PC bongs. So Vietnam has thousands, Indonesia, tens of thousands, China, 200,000 PC cafes, um, Korea, 20,000 PC bongs, 15,000 now. A lot of these studios have been inspired by the PC success of the game. So PUBG, the largest streamer actually on YouTube, is from Vietnam, called Mixie Gaming. He streams PUBG PC. He gets around 60 to 70,000 average concurrent viewers, and him alone had more hours watched than the entire Overwatch League. That's how popular PUBG PC in, in Vietnam is. But the main, the main storyline that I want to tell you guys is because PUBG PC was so popular, these passionate people that love PUBG wanted to bring this experience on mobile. So Garena here, the very early version, or sorry, Free Fire, was made by 111.studio, which Garena picked up. This is before there's any Garena branding. I looked into the history. I know some developers based in Vietnam. Um, and they're a very small independent uh, studio, apparently. Uh, we don't know when Garena, if Garena either funded them or, or self-developed them. But because they found this talent, right, they made the game it was 1 versus 19. The hardware back then didn't really support you know, you know, 100 people into a game. It was just literally a free-for-all, which is called Free Fire. And then from there, Garena took over, helped them with distribution, and they became a billion-dollar hit. What if you invested in Garena, right? What if your fund invested in that game early, that studio? It'll probably return your entire fund. So now, what we do we see in mobile, right? It's growing in the number of gamers across the entire spectrum. Like PC is growing, console is growing, but mobile specifically is growing a lot in the hardcore segment, which is online multiplayer gaming. And in the past three years, these multiplayer action games like Honor of Kings have started to dominate and appear on the top 10 revenue charts. You can see Honor of Kings that I showed you in the first uh, slide of the eSport, was launched in 2015. It actually had a very humble beginning as well. It launched as a three versus three game, which is a copy of League of Legends on PC, which is the most popular esport, and actually flopped. A lot of Chinese people were like, why am I gonna play a watered down version of League of Legends on my phone? And the teamy, the studio behind it, actually almost closed down. But because they, the, the four, five inch smartphone revolution in terms of adoption came into play, better hardware, they then changed it to five versus five, and then the rest is history. That game makes one to two billion dollars uh, a year. And you can see now all the biggest titles, PUBG Mobile, Knives Out, Garena Free Fire, they're all down reaching the top of the, the revenue charts. They're also reaching the top of the YouTube charts. Globally, four 
out of the top 10 games, the most watched games on YouTube are mobile esports games. Um, and also, if you look at downloads, in the past year, Free Fire and PUBG Mobile were the two most downloaded mobile games um, last year across Google, Android, and iOS. Why is this a big deal? Because you see number three, Subway Surfers. Someone's probably played it here. It, it was the most downloaded game of the entire decade at 2.7 billion downloads. So what we're seeing is casual games are now not the most downloaded games. It's now becoming these mobile esports titles. Triple A experiences, we heard a lot of the other portfolio companies talk about it yesterday. Triple A experiences are coming to mobile, and the smartphone is a very powerful device. If you just narrow it down to the top seven games that are esports games, then mobile is four out of seven, which is pretty significant. And we also see this in tournaments. This is a one-time event. This is the championship event. Fortnite was not the most popular. Neither was League of Legends outside of China. It was Free Fire. They had 1.2 million average viewers for their World Series. And that actually eclipsed Fortnite, League of Legends, and so on. That's a, that's a very big deal. But of course, average viewers for one championship event doesn't really tell the whole story. Mobile esports is still growing. There's not a lot of franchise leagues. There's not consistent uh, competitions that we see with League of Legends, Dota 2. Uh, Counter-Strike, and that's why these PC esports are still, still the kings, especially League of Legends. It's still the biggest and most successful esports by far. But number five is Arena Valor, right? They have now broken into one of the top five esports, and this will start, this chart will change. Um, some people might not agree with, from, that come from PC esports, but in five years, this will be all mobile esports. So let's talk about like what does it look like right now as of 2018. League of Legends, their peak viewers, unique viewers, was they set a record for the entire esports industry. It was 99.6 million. Tencent also didn't really make a big announcement, but it's in their quarterly earnings report that I show you here. They announced and shared that Honor of Kings, a game that you saw, reached 75 million unique viewers. That's pretty close, and this is just China. Keep in mind, one in 15 Chinese people play this game. It has over 200 million monthly active users. And per the, the uh, president of Tencent Esports, who I actually met when Tencent hosted me in Shenzhen, um, he shared in, in news articles that Honor of Kings did its best esports ever last year. They grew 41% total views of all of their esports content, which is uh, media, news, videos, et cetera, from 17 billion to 24 billion in 2019. And we're now starting to see this not only in China, but in Southeast Asia, in India, and that's something I'll talk more about here. But let's talk about China a little bit more. So this is a report from Gamma Delta, or CNG. They share that the Chinese esports game market was about 14 billion US dollars. This includes the, the esports titles, not just esports revenues, by the way. And it was an increase of 16%, and predominantly was led by the development of mobile esports as the main driving force. So, so that is a significant deal. There's other mobile titles, not just uh, Honor of Kings in China, that are very popular. There's Crossfire Mobile, there's Game for Peace Mobile, which has 50 million daily active players, and so on. And let's look at how the growth has happened for Honor of Kings. This is pretty silly. This is a deck that Tencent sent to me um, when they were trying to recruit me to come, become their talent caster for um, their mobile titles in the West. And you can see how much the growth has happened. So now mobile esports in China is saturated. Um, they have to basically hire the Katy Perry's and Matthew McConaughey's of China to, to basically user, to get more user acquisition um, in, in China. And you can see now they've grown 4X you know, stage audience of just 1,000 to 13,000 to 15,000. Um, and also billions in viewership for their uh, esports competitions. Revenue-wise, it's also making a big deal. So they released their, their King's Expedition update, and Nomura Bank from, um, from Japan shared that Honor of Kings actually made one billion in revenue in the US back in, a, in just a month. And, and that is how popular this game is. And, and just recently, um, Honor of Kings hit a 100 daily active users. There's only 14 countries in the world that have over 100 million people living in it. So this game hit actually 100 million daily active users just this past February. And my team competed here. We qualified as a top 16 um, representing Immortals to compete at the King Pro League uh, Winter Championship. And let me show you just the audience. I was inside, and I'll show you kind of the audience and talk more about the demographic mix there. 
他他们如果打团的时候，你往整地方放个墙，是没有人会注意到的。他这个墙的伤害也很容易长。对，你会莫名其妙的走到墙，他他这个墙伤害是巨大，而且而且。You can see it's uh it's it's pretty full. There's um sixty percent of that audience are female. So every event I've been to three live events now in China, in Shanghai, in Beijing, um and in Chengdu, and and sixty percent of the audience is female. It's pretty remarkable actually um, when you think about uh, mobile esports. And I'll share more of that with you. This is the King Pro League in the Shanghai Mercedes Benz Arena. Has a capacity of 18,000, and they sold out for their championships as well. This is in Xi'an, the, one of the ancient capitals of China. They had an outdoor competition for their uh, KPL, and it's also a big part of uh, culture. So let me show you a really cool video in, in the recent Wuhan um, competition that they had. <laughs> So Wuhan has two very famous bridges. They lit up 700 buildings, and they had two flying dragons across both buildings from one bridge to the next. And as they meet, they then advertise the KPL is happening in the city. So they have localized and franchised their esports across all these cities. Um, and because of the popularity of the KPL, the franchise costs have increased tenfold, um, from 1 million to now around 8 to 10 million. So it's pretty crazy how big this game has gotten in China. It reminds me of the StarCraft craze in South Korea. Um, and we're seeing that not just in China, but now mobile esports is showing us this esports craze is happening all over the world. So let's talk about the audience real quick. You know, 200 million monthly active players, 54% of those 200 million monthly active players are females. This is the beauty of mobile. It's a democratization and access to online multiplayer gaming where females are now much, much higher in terms of percentage of player base. And they're the biggest fans. I mean, I sat in these stadiums, and I almost lost my hearing, because they were screaming so loudly and cheering for their rock star mobile gamers. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see the fandom in, in China. And you can see there, just look at the picture. Mostly females. It's, it's crazy. So one thing uh, the Tencent director shared with me was, he's like, Honor of Kings is so popular in China that it's one of the top dating apps with young people. This is how young people meet. They meet through the game. You can find people nearby. You can add them on WeChat. And all of a sudden, if you, if you carry them, you're a good player, you're, you're a good guy player, then, then you can find a girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. So uh, you can see PC, it's opposite, right? PC, even in China and US, ten, usually 10% 10 of the player base is, is male. Um, it's still very popular esports, as you see. But the audience demographic is a little different. Um, this, this is very interesting to me, too. This is a, a smaller esports event, but 90% of this audience is female. Look very, very closely. 90% of that audience is female for Honor of Kings, KPL. And then you look at Dota 2, PC. 90% is male. Still popular, just different, different type of uh, um, gender mix. And because Honor of Kings is so popular with females, you get to cool, do really cool activations like this. So they took the lipstick color of all the famous female heroes in that game, or the top five, and it sold out within an hour. That's how popular uh, the game is and how it really cool collaborations like this can happen. Mobile uh, esports game, Game for Peace, which is basically PUBG Mobile for, for, chi for China, which is on track to do over 1 billion USD, if they're not already accomplished it, has 51% of, uh, of their entire fan base audience is female. Um, you also see this in Free Fire in Brazil. Um, this is actually a team from Thailand, but they competed in the Brazil Free Fire World Series that I mentioned earlier. The third place team, which is really hard. You're competing against countries and the best teams from all over the country. They placed third and they had a female pro player on that team, which is amazing for esports and the growth of the entire industry. Um, and speaking of Thailand, this is Garena World. It's crazy. 300 people attend over a Saturday and Sunday. And it used to be PC esports was the flagship draw for this event, but now it's mobile. It's mobile esports. And you can see the audience. It's pretty insane. Like, who needs chairs when you have that many people? You can everyone just sit on the floor. Um, and you see a lot of this. Everyone is playing esports games together. This is the local show show kind of thing that PC Bongs have created and which led to the birth of esports in South Korea. Because I, I, I was there. I grew up and went to school in South Korea from 1999 to 2003. So I'm seeing very similar parallels to 
um, the birth of PC esports in terms of stadium esports in Korea to now the birth of mobile esports here because it's kind of bringing back that PC bong social experience where there's a lot of social interaction. Mobile Legends just recently here. This is another game in um, that's that's really popular in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Has over 500 million downloads. Just this past Saturday on February 8th, they peaked at 476,000 concurrent viewers, which is equal to League of Legends. Uh, League European Championship Series, which also peaked at 476,000, but that's global viewers, mostly in Europe. This is just one country, Indonesia. So the penetration and saturation of some of these games is just, it's, it's insane how popular these mobile esports title is. So let's, get, let's give you an example of what Mobile Legends esports looks like here with the video. So you can see, they're just like any other esports fan. Console, PC. The main point that I wanted to talk about during the presentation is, is not about the platform. Just think of it as about the game and the love of the game. PUBG Mobile, they have a, a huge esports um, that, that they announced this year, but they're doing a huge esports program. They have 50 million daily active players outside of China. It is the most popular game in the world right now. Tencent shared in their recent quarterly earnings report that PUBG Mobile is the largest game by DAU and MAU in the world in terms of multiplayer um, action games. And it's also the sixth most, most watched game on YouTube. Arena of Valor, the growth from 2018 to 2019, 2.5x growth um, in terms of viewers here. You can see the number of growth for Arena. This is the fifth most watched esports by esports hours in globally um, in, uh, for, for mobile and PC esports. So what is the future of esports? Like I said, think less about the platform. A lot of people talk about mobile. They think about the technical part. They really focus on the technicality of it. Like it's not a mouse and keyboard. You're touching the screen and all that. Don't worry about the, the, the interface. It's more about the enjoyment of the game. Um, players and fans really determine what an esport is. So, and the esports fundamentals are really about the game quality. So China was it's the biggest PC game market, and now it has a thriving mobile esports market. Vietnam, to the Philippines, to Indonesia, they all had thriving PC uh, gaming market, but mobile has just increased the accessibility of online multiplayer uh, to their hands, and it's just much easier to play on the go and so on instead of sitting at home um, playing on a PC. And you can see the, in terms of the, the total magnitude of these downloads. So Free Fire has 450 million downloads, PUBG's 600 million downloads. Total, it's around 1.8 billion downloads for these games within the past just two years. Um, so there's probably about a billion people playing mobile Battle Royale, because there's some overlap, of course. Some of these games have launched separately, but there's probably around a billion people playing mobile Battle Royale games. And all these games are making pretty much $1 billion or more a year. It also has very, very high engagement rate. People think that mobile gamers aren't real gamers. Um, they are, and they're also real fans. Uh, so if you look at it, the engagement rate for, over, for someone who's over a million Instagram followers, a 6% engagement rate is very, very high. Most Instagram, uh, like, like most people with over a million followers gets 1%. He has 22%. And if you compare to PC esports or other esports, they hover around the 10 to 15% engagement rate, which is very, very high as well. So I don't want to underplay PC or, or console here. But mobile is showing us that the engagement is very high. And you can see the, the, uh, a report by App Annie, the top gains by downloads and the rank by average time per user, it's those three uh, multiplayer action core games where a lot of people are spending so much time with. Why? Because in-person social interaction, you can have cool mobile tournaments and malls that we see in China. So in China, there's 100,000 plus mobile esports tournaments that happen pretty much almost every month. And this is what facilitates and helps mobile esports thrive because of this social interaction. Also, in, also you see this the same thing not only in China but in uh, Malaysia. This is a uh, at the mall in Petaling Jaya, Malaysia, and they fill up the entire mall for a mobile esports competition. It's pretty insane, right? <laughs> so this is mobile. It's it's basically growing the the entire esports industry and the number of gamers significantly. You know, because a lot of people um, have not tried out gaming or multiplayer action gaming, 
But because of the smartphone, it's introducing them, and they're now becoming esports fans and consumers, which is great for all of us. Um, and mobile esports impact in gaming events. This is a very interesting uh, thing about India here. The Duo Arena, which is the largest uh, competitive, vid competi competitive video game event in India and Pakistan, they had 22,000 uh, participants, which is, which is good, right? And it grew to 70,000 in 2018. And then they added a game called PUBG Mobile, which has 15 million daily active players, and it surged to 1.5 million participants. This is the scale of mobile. And they're very rabid fans. I mean, they love the game, and, and they love playing PC as well. But just the scale of mobile is just on a whole different level. And it's just starting out. It's just within the past two to three years. Uh, the, the Free Fire just started their eSports last year. Uh, mobile Legends, which, which we saw earlier, had their eSports going for about three years, and, and now they're in their fifth season. Um, Arena of Valor has been an eSport for about three years as well, and uh, there, there's growth year to year. Mobile esports and social. How many gamers will share their profile picture in a video game? You see this with Gen Z across the world. They're very, very comfortable. It's their identity, right? If you think about if you if you grow up and you're playing mobile uh, multiplayer games, like, um, like similar to how Americans grew up playing console, Call of Duty, or Fortnite, this is a big part of their social identity. So they're very comfortable sharing their profile pictures, and it's become kind of its own social network for a lot of these people um, within the countries that, that these games are very, very dominant in. And mobile esports has helped esports become even more mainstream. As we know, esports is growing all across the world, um, but this is the percentage of gamers that are strongly drawn to esports. You can see China and greater Southeast Asia is, is much higher than the United States. But the reason why I love this chart is because that tells me how much more growth there is in the West. Uh, we know esports is a global phenomenon. You know, every country wants to have access to these games. They get a big, massive player base. They get a big audience, and then esports starts to take off. And you can see, because of mobile, the countries that are leading the pack in terms of this is a different uh, survey here shared by Hootsuite. Is, the, is this the percentage of internet users who said that they recently watched an esports tournament? And you can see China, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, and India, which are all have embraced mobile esports. That percentage is much higher. It's just common unit economics and math at this point. And in Southeast Asia, which is pretty exciting, so it's not just a China thing. Like Korea, you know, Starka was like a Korea thing back in the 2000s. It's a, a whole world thing outside the West. So 180 million mobile gamers, that's 36% of smartphone users in greater Southeast Asia. If you look at the total population of greater Southeast Asia, that's Chinese Taipei plus Southeast Asia, that's 679 million people. That means one out of four people play uh, a mobile esports game. Uh, this is a great study uh, that, that Nico Partners has done and shared uh, with us here. And that's quite amazing. That's basically rivaling the esports craze in South Korea. Because when I was in South Korea, um, one in five Koreans was an esports fan in Korea. You know, it was a national sport. The only sport that was more watched than StarCraft back then was soccer in Korea. So we're seeing mobile esports kind of take over because of the massive um, scale here that we're seeing with the player base. And also uh, female fans as well, we're seeing that it's, it's encouraging more female players. Uh, we're seeing the same trend in, in the United States. For example, Fortnite is about one out of four players on Fortnite are female, actually, um, we're, versus like MOBAs, traditional MOBAs on PC, it's 10% female. So we're seeing a lot more females in the United States and across the world now getting involved with these multiplayer um, action games. So if you isolate mobile esports specifically and not the entire esports industry, then the percentage of female fans is going to be much higher, especially in China. So great, mobile is huge. What's next? This is an awesome report here on smartphone penetration rates. There is a lot more growth to go. There's a lot more free fires that have not been discovered um, and this is a $100 billion industry, right, with billions of players. And you can see the smartphone penetration rates across all these countries. Indonesia, we saw, with how many esports fans they have, they're only sitting at around 30% or so uh, smartphone penetration rates. Other countries like Vietnam, which is very big, and Philippines, very big in mobile esports, their, their smartphone penetration rates is not that high as well. Philippines is, is uh, thousands of islands and arch archipelagical. So it's actually really hard to get data and access to uh, a solid internet 
uh, wireless 4G connection in the Philippines. So if that continues to grow, by 2025, a lot of these countries will hit 80 to 90% plus smartphone penetration. And we're going to see mobile esports continue to explode now. Um, and it really is about one game. One game that gets introduced to a country or a region, and it becomes the most popular game that gets played there. Right? Free Fire, all the games that I mentioned, they all dominate their own territories. Free Fire is very popular in Brazil. Mobile Legends is very popular in Indonesia. Arena of Valor is not popular in Indonesia. It's kind of formed its own kind of social network effects where once it reaches critical mass, no other competitor can really compare. But Arena of Valor has a stronghold in Thailand, which I showed you earlier, the greener, the greener world. Um, Arena of Valor is, is the dominant uh, mobile MOBA there. And Mobile Legends, which is basically the same game, cannot compete with them. So we're seeing what we saw with StarCraft back in the 2000s, but we're seeing multiple countries now having this massive esports craze, and mobile esports is really driving that. So I do want to share this story here, because I was there in Korea back in 1999, um, going to high school, and StarCraft changed my life, because I was good at the game, and I became one of the popular kids when this game kind of blew up. Uh, and yes, I did get a girlfriend because I was good at it. Um, and this is when it peaked. It had 120,000 fans show up in Busan uh, for the Pro League Sky Finals. And the reason why this game became a phenomenon, it's, very, it's a very similar parallel to mobile esports, is because of the social interaction. PC bongs in Korea from 1998 basically grew 405% to 20,000 PC bongs in 1999. And that was when broadband internet and StarCraft and online multiplayer literally took off. It was a tech catalyst. And then it led us to see the birth of Star. And that's why this did not happen in China. This did not happen in any other country, right? It was unique to Korea because of the environment, the technology catalyst that happened there, the investment into broadband. And it was a, it was a very interesting phenomenon that I, didn't, I would never have thought would have reached to the United States. Right? Because I thought this was just a very weird Korean thing that I was a big fan of. And I went to Cornell University and left esports behind, unfortunately. Um, but if you look at the history and the, the, the tech and social trends, they're very similar. Very, very similar, right? Tech catalysts. Um, and as, you, as investors, you guys know that you pattern match. New technologies come out, and that, that creates new um, products and platforms and so on. You can see it's very similar. The tech back in 1998 was broadband and PC online multiplayer games. It was tens of millions of people. Today, it's smartphones, right? Over 70% or 80% of smartphones are now five-inch screens. And the smartphones are strong enough or powerful enough that they can support these kind of core multiplayer action games. And what is the other tech catalyst is, is wireless 4G. China, just like Korea, actually, Korea heavily invested in broadband ahead of any other country. And in China, also put massive amounts of funding and investment into their wireless infrastructure as well. And you can see why mobile esports has become very, very popular there. Um, the question is, will this ever make it to the United States? We don't know. I'm hopeful it will. Um, it took 10 years for StarCraft to come here because, again, StarCraft 1 was not the game that, that took off in the West. The one game that took off in the West was StarCraft 2. Right? That was the game that, that kind of brought esports into the limelight and made it a little bit more mainstream. So the question is, what mobile game will that be? And will there be a mobile game that will help the United States embrace uh, mobile esports? So I was a part of Vainglory, which was Super Evil Mega Corp. I was one of the original uh, co-founders of the esports orgs, and I competed in there. It had a very niche audience. Uh, but I think there's a lot of traction. I think I feel like in the West, mobile esports is like a struggling startup that has really, really high traction because there's a lot of Fortnite mobile players that prefer to play on their iPad or, or phones. Um, Fortnite mobile has 100 million downloads on iOS. So there definitely is demand there. And I think that's, that's what really matters. It's not about the, the controls or whatever. It's about the demand and, and how much they enjoy playing the game. So speaking of that, that is what esports looks like for today. It's, it's always a mod of a popular PC game. So a lot of the inspiration for mobile esports comes from PC games that's adapted to mobile in a very unique way. So Free Fire, Battle Rouse is you have 100 people jumping into an island. Free Fire is a much smaller island, and it's only 50 people. So it can be, it's optimized to run on mobile, right? 
Um, and the games are much, much faster. It's the same thing as uh, Honor of Kings, which is uh, basically a copy of League of Legends on mobile. The games are half the time. So Free Fire, an average game is 10 to 15 minutes. Honor of Kings, an average game is 15 to 20 minutes. League of Legends, an average game is about 45 minutes. It's a little longer. So you have to kind of sim simplify it. You add less complexity, but you keep the same core gameplay experience that made that PC game very, very popular in the first place. It's optimized for two gigs of RAM, and they're quick games. And finally, the one thing that I've noticed, I don't know if this could be a pattern matching uh, trend here, but League of Legends was the biggest and most popular PC game, still is, in China. And the studio that built Honor of Kings is from China. If you look at Vietnam as well, the studio that made Free Fire is from Vietnam, and PUBG PC is, it took the entire country by storm. It came the most popular game that was played at PC cafes in Vietnam. And, and I feel like because of these passionate PC gamers, they want to take this experience to mobile, and that's why they decide to make that jump when a lot of PC core gamers would say, why would you ever play PUBG on a, on a phone? Why would you ever play League on a phone? But I feel like these people who are passionate and believe that they can have that same core experience on a phone, they start these studios, and they build these games, and the rest is history. So in the future, what does mobile esports look like? Um, I think that it won't be natively played on PC or console. If you think about StarCraft again, you could not play that game on console. <laughs> StarCraft was a uniquely and beautiful PC game. Um, and it leveraged all of the technology that PC had to offer because back then consoles weren't connected to the internet. PCs were connected through LAN, right? So it has to be something, I feel like the next mobile esports is gonna leverage the mobile tech that a lot of these games don't really do. They're kind of modded and copies of what um, PC games are. And then in the, in the long-term future, I used to work for Apple. I, I was a GM for them, and I ran a $70 million business with Apple. And the future is their mobile custom silicon. That is going to be the next decade here. Um, it's going to basically empower the next AR and VR devices. We already see the current processor is able to have ray tracing. Um, they had NetEase and Qualcomm. Uh, and uh, Huawei, sorry, was able to demonstrate that ray tracing is possible on a mobile processor, which is to me mind blowing. Um, and better battery tech. There's lithium. Um, there's new lithium technology that will imp improve the battery effect, and that's going to create a whole new era of awesome games, where some of these multiplayer games are going to be some very, very big mobile esports hits. So thank you, and appreciate you guys listening to my talk here. So are there any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, th I think the uh, design and stuff definitely plays a role because a lot of the heroes in the game are, are very cute and designed for females, but also uh, for, for males. But I think where it really starts is, is the young generation where when they grow up, they don't really have a console. Um, they have access to a PC bong or PC cafe, but they grow up playing this game on their smartphone. And that's how actually Honor of Kings took off because um, a lot of people didn't want to get into League. It was a much more complicated game on PC. So they just started playing Honor of Kings. And a majority of those new players were female. And because the female uh, base grew and became really popular with females in, in, in like school, social circles, teenagers, the guys started paying attention and be like, I can play this game, get really good at it, and impress these girls. And that's why Honor of Kings, 54% and I don't think any other game has accomplished this for a hardcore multiplayer action game, 54% of that player base is female. And, and that's why it's also able to generate so much revenue. So I've met a lot of these, uh, these girls that when I was in China and they visited LA, um, they spent you know, $100 to $200 on these co cosmetic skins. I mean, that's how much some of these skins um, cost. And, and they, have, they can definitely play on PC, but they just love 
the accessibility and, and the ease that mobile gives them. So I think it more has to do with the life stage of the consumer. And I think what mobile is doing is it's capturing and introducing a lot of these gamers um, to multiplayer online gaming um, on a mobile device. So, so I think that is a reason why a lot of mobile esports is taking off all over the world because they're not gonna, they don't, their parents aren't gonna buy them a console or um, why would they pay, play at a PC cafe and pay, you know, in Vietnam it's 30 cents an hour to pay on a PC cafe. Why even pay that when you can have that same core gameplay experience on your phone? So I think that's what's really driving the, the massive adoption um, for female and, and male. Uh, the best decision to take advantage. Yeah, I thought a lot about this is, um, so what happens is the way that Free Fire and a lot of these like independent studios uh, test their game, they launch it on uh, third party Android stores like AP, APK Peer. And you can actually look at what the popular games are because a lot of the users use those third party stores. And then based on the traction of those games, you can basically see if you really like that studio, then invest in that studio. That's what I would do if I was a VC. I would be literally scanning the third-party Android stores and see what games are, are, are becoming hits. But it's also trends, too. There's, there's patterns, right? Right now, Mobile Battle Royale, we don't know if there's going to be another Free Fire for Mobile Battle Royale, but let's say Escape from Tarov or another new game, like another Overwatch or, or another PUBG comes out that's like a new format, a different type of game. Um, I would say start looking at any type of mobile mobile independent studios that are developing a modded version of and trying to take that PC experience to mobile. Um, and we see that time, like Moontown was a game that saw what Honor of Kings did in China. They saw like how much traction it was getting and it literally developed the, the game for, to launch in Southeast Asia and then they basically took market share away from Tencent because they were able to put that game out immediately and now that game is a billion dollar game. So. Yeah, there's, uh, I think there's two answers to that. Um, so I, I played Vainglory and also played a lot of the other mobile games. So Cyber Hunter is another game that's cross-platform on PC and mobile. Vainglory was as well. But because it was a mobile first game, um, there's not a lot of PC play on it because it's, if you think about the, uh, the, the, the technology and like the graphics are just not as nice on a PC when you take that mobile game to PC. Um, but you look at Fortnite, there's a lot of potential there because you see Fortnite has over 5 million reviews on the App Store and it had 100 million downloads on iOS and another 20 or so million on Android. And it's very popular because kids, when they play Fortnite at home on their console, mostly console and, and PC, they then play it with their friends at school on mobile. So that cross-platform play was very smart for, for Epic to do that. So I do see that um, being something that would help increase the reach and, and the player base. But in terms of, of mobile esports, Fortnite hasn't really pushed mobile esports um, um, that hard um, in the West because uh, they probably see that a lot of their player base are probably playing it on console and PC, and then they're taking the game to to school to play after school or, or, or at recess um, on their phones with their with their teammates. So, but I believe that crossplay is going to be a big part of how the the accessibility for these games in general. The, the, the easier that we lower the barrier to entry, that's why smartphone gaming is, is taking off, is because it, it significantly lowers the barriers of entry to experience and try out these, these great multiplayer uh, smartphone games. Awesome, so it looks like there's no questions. Thank you so much, guys, for, for your time, appreciate it.